Okay, we're live, letting folks in. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, just a few housekeeping things today. If you haven't been to one of these programs before, um, you will be muted and your um, recording, I mean, sorry, your ability to turn on your camera has been turned off. Um, that's just to give us a little bit better of a stream here. Um, but if you have any questions, please put those in the chat and we'll get to those as we're able. Um, my name is Vanessa with the Dallas Public Library and we host this program in conjunction with the Department of Environmental Quality and Sustainability. So thank you so much for joining us today in the spooky season and we'll learn all about the wicked plants. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Judy to um, tell a little bit about what their department does and to introduce our speaker. Hello, uh, good morning everyone. Oh, I should say good afternoon, it's 12.01. So thank you for joining us for this great lunch break. I'm so excited to be here with Kevin Burns for uh, Wicked Plants. Uh, it's hard to believe that a plant can be wicked, but I believe they can. And since we're close to Halloween, we thought this would be a really super fun topic. Um, we just uh, finished our Waterwise Landscape Tour, the 27th year of it. And so it was all about plants, uh, none of them bad, I don't think, but uh, we had a, a great program this past Saturday and hopefully some of you were able to join us. Um, if you were, thank you so much. And if you didn't get your plant picked up, we have it at City Hall. And so make arrangements to come on by and get that. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, the Office of Environmental Quality and Sustainability uh, operates within everything that's environmental on behalf of the city. We work with, for example, on the Comprehensive Environmental uh, Climate Action Plan, which we've been working on now for two years. Uh, we work with 17 different departments regarding that and with some outside groups and organizations as well. Uh, we have the Urban Forest Master Plan that uh, we will be engaged in. And then we actually are working on an, ur an urban agricultural plan and that will be will be we actually have started kicking that off in the meetings for that and so you'll be hearing more about it in the months ahead so this is a perfect forum uh, for all these plans and projects particularly this urban um, agriculture plan so um, I'm excited to learn more about it myself and uh, but it'll probably be early next year before we have more details on that um, you know, one of the things that we really talk about a lot in our department is water. It's such a valuable resource. And there's kind of two, well, there's a lot of different components regarding water. But one of them is, of course, the water, the potable water that's at our homes and trying to save it and conserve it every way we can. You know, rain barrels, uh, drought tolerant plants, plants that aren't wickedly absorbing the water. And we're going to hear more from Kevin about that. Um, you know, don't let your sprinkler systems uh, spray into the street, get them adjusted, you know, plan for that, work that into your, your budgets and your priorities for each year to make sure those irrigation systems only run twice a week, if you even need it uh, that much, and then make sure that water's not going everywhere except on your landscape. Um, and also, of course, that water and the water that falls from the sky is actually storm water. And so all that water ends up in, for the city of Dallas, there's a separate stormwater drainage system. Uh, it's a, called an MS4 permit and the city is permitted to let this water allow to go into the system throughout the city. And then that water is then discharged into all the different water bodies um, throughout the Dallas-Fort uh, Worth Metroplex. So the lakes, the creeks, the streams, and of course, ultimately it gets into the Trinity River. And I think we were fascinated to learn recently that 54% of all the fresh water that ends up in the Gulf um, Coast estuaries along Galveston Bay comes from the Trinity River. So it's so important for us to do everything we can to number one, save water around our homes, but then also make sure pesticides, herbicides, pet waste, all those things don't end up in that water and then further, you know, gets. Uh, taken downstream to pollute all sorts of environments uh, all along the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, as well as, you know, this water has to be taken out of the Trinity, put through processing plants. And so the cleaner it is, really, the quicker, the faster it comes out of those plants and then can be used by livestock and by people. So, you know, thank you as always for everything you do to care for the environment and all these fabulous natural resources we have right here 
in um, Dallas, Fort Worth. And with that, I'm going to read a little bit uh, about our wonderful speaker today. Um, he is um, Kevin Burns. He's been gardening for over 20 years and his program is entitled Wicked Plants. And he is a master gardener and he has a passion for gardening. It began shortly after he and his wife were married and toured some formal gardens in Germany on their honeymoon. And so uh, it's it's been a long uh, standing, uh, I think, love affair, not just with his wife, but with the gardens and with what they plant in them as well. He realized his backyard at the time consisted of turf, a mimosa tree, and a chain link fence. <laughs> and he decided, you know what, I need to change that. And he did. He loves Texas perennial plants and roses. His wife suspects the reason he likes native perennials is because he is a bit, uh, how shall I say, frugal, and uh, they do come back every year. So I think that's really a smart practice. It's a smart water saving practice. Um, they um, actually own a small 55 acre ranch in the Texas Hill Country outside of Fredericksburg, and they run a bed and breakfast there. So uh, they, their property is designated as wildlife management area. And along with providing sustenance to the native wild animals living on the property, they plant 25 to 75 new native trees and sow native grasses and wildflowers annually in an effort to return the property to its natural pre-cattle ranching state. I think you can see that um, he is really very knowledgeable about this, gets his hands into the dirt quite often and um, has really carried on a great tradition. Um, he, has, he loves cats and he lives with three of them. Kevin and his wife also try to visit gardens and arboretums for inspiration and photographs wherever they travel. Um, he is part of the Speakers Bureau for the Dallas Masters Gardeners Association and his talks include Texas Native and Adaptive Plants, Wicked Weeds, Composting, Texas flower, Wildflowers, Growing and Cooking with Herbs, and Ground Cover. With that, I'm going to hand this program over to Kevin. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, well, thank you for having me. Um, as I said, uh, she mentioned, uh, with the Dallas County Master Gardeners and... Um, well, I'm just going to get to it. We're going to talk a little bit about wicked plants today. Uh, Dallas County Master Gardeners. Why is my clicker not clicking? Oh, well, I seem to be having a... My, my computer has froze up. Oh, I'm no. going... <laughs> oh, we, can still hear you. we can still hear you, Kevin. We just can't see oh, you. Oh, here we go. Okay. okay. It's, it's doing... All of a sudden, it started. I don't know what the deal is, but... Uh, well, let me back up. There we go. Okay, so if you don't know about uh, Master Gardeners, we're part of the Texas A&M Extension Service, and our mission is to educate people about good horticultural practices. Uh, most of the plants you're gonna, we're going to talk about today, you don't want in your yard. Uh, and with that, uh, oh, wrong direction. There we go. Um, okay, so Kevin, oh, Kevin, sure. um, I don't, I'm not sure if you're sharing your screen anymore. We can't, I, I can't see at least on my end. I don't know about the other people in the program, but I'm oh, seeing okay. you, but I'm not seeing you. I'm not seeing your presentation. Uh, let me see why that's not happening here. Hold on. Uh, let's see. If you go back to the share screen, does it let you share it again? Well, actually, while, um, Did we lose Kevin? Looks like we. I think we yeah. may have. Uh, hopefully, um, he'll be able to jump back on here in just a second. Um. So, um, Yvonne. So, the Dallas County Master Gardeners uh, fall under the umbrella of Texas A and M, um, but they have their own email address that people can submit questions directly to the Dallas County Master Gardeners. I'm not so sure about. Uh, and maybe someone else who is on this call that's a master gardener will know about if, if a and Texas A&M ever forwards questions to the master gardeners. Oh, and I think Kevin's back here. Unmute. There. Here can you see? Okay. Uh, can you see my presentation now? Yes, yes thank you. Oh, okay, cool. We're back on track. I got some weird message that says internet connection unstable, then everything went weird. 
Okay, uh, back to wicked plants. Um, well, what are wicked plants? They are, okay, why is this not advancing now? <clears throat> Don't you love technology? There we go. Okay, so I went through that real fast, but so wicked plants are basically plants that are either deadly, illegal, uh, intoxicating, dangerous, or they can be destructive and invasive. So let's talk about the deadly ones first, because those are my favorite. Um, and I think that's being Halloween, that's kind of an appropriate thing. Uh, let's talk about aconite. Uh, it's in the buttercup family. It's native to uh, Northern Europe. Uh, it grows about two and a half to three feet tall. And it is simply one of the most dangerous plants on the planet. Every bit of this plant is poisonous. It will kill you. Um, basically, uh, now you can eat it. It won't really hurt you too bad. But if you get it in your blood or whatever, uh, really bad stuff. Uh, now, if you eat enough of it, it will definitely kill you. Uh, basically, it kills you. Uh, it interrupts the calcium uh, channels, and you go into immediate heart cardiac arrest. Um, aconite's been around for a really long time, that, as far as like people knowing about it and stuff, and knowing that it's deadly. Um, the they have found Bronze Age uh, tools and stuff where they have uh, tested, and there's like aconite has been on the blades. And then uh, they've also found like pottery and stuff that had aconite in it. And uh, during Roman times, if you were caught growing aconite, uh, you could receive the death penalty because they knew the only reason you were growing it was to kill somebody. Uh, so it's it pretty deadly stuff. Uh, and during World War II, uh, some of the guys in the SS, the stormtrooper guys, would actually put a tincture made out of aconite on their bullets so if the bullet didn't kill you, the aconite would. Uh, uh, it's really bad stuff. Um, it's, the flower is kind of pretty, and it comes in all different colors. Uh, it has other names. One of them is Monk's Hood. Uh, if you're a Harry Potter fan, uh, you will uh, remember that Professor Snape actually made a potion <coughs> Excuse me, uh, that prevented Professor Lupin from turning into a werewolf using aconite. So uh, I guess J.K. Rowling knew a little bit about plants, too. Anyway, uh, it doesn't really grow here in Texas. It doesn't like this hot weather. Uh, of course, with enough money, time, and effort, you can really grow anything. But why would you want to? Um, it, it's really pretty bad stuff. You know, if you had a pet or, you know, kids or whatever, it, it would it would not be a good thing. Um, in fact, in uh, in the early 1800s in Scotland, uh, in the village, I forget the village's name now. It's slipped my mind. I, I actually do know it, but I can't think of it at the moment. Uh, anyway, the local village priest was doing a little shindig for all of his parishioners, sent his housekeeper out to dig up some uh, uh, horseradish root to go with the roast beef. And she ended up digging up some aconite root by mistake and uh, killed uh, seven of the villagers and put the rest into the hospital for a long time. So not a fun plant to have around. Uh, this is the castor bean plant. Uh, it is native to Africa. It can get up to 30 feet tall uh, and it grows kind of like a column. Um, I like it because it uh, kind of gives your garden that uh, Jurassic Park look. Um, it, it's, it's a very interesting looking plant. Um, and it can come in uh, purple or green or whatever. And it's got these nice broad leaves but every part of this plant is also uh, quite deadly with the seeds being the most deadly. Uh, let's see here, I got another picture here. There, this is uh, in front of my friend uh, George's house uh, here in Dallas, and she's growing some. And in fact, they, uh, a couple of years ago, they had a bunch of it growing out at the Dallas Arboretum and it was beautiful. I mean, it was literally 30 feet tall and just, just a really pretty plant. Um, and you notice these little pink frilly things at the top. Well, those are flowers. And oh, that's not what we want. Uh, there we go. Uh, sorry about the bad photo. It's a little out of focus here. Uh, but these things are fl the flowers, and they actually harden up and turn into seed pods uh, over time as the plant matures. And these little frilly things actually turn into like, they're almost like thorns. Uh, they're really prickly, and you really don't want to hold them too much. And inside each one of these is two to three seeds that look identical to pinto beans. 
trust me, you do not want to substitute these for pinot beans. Three of them contain enough poison uh, to kill you. Uh, the poison is called ricin, and you may have heard that. It's been in the news in the past few years. In fact, uh, uh, somebody actually mailed some to President Obama uh, when he was in office, and uh, of course, they frown upon that, and uh, there was a big search going on, and they actually called the culprit. Uh, it was actually a domestic dispute where a uh, wife tried to pin it on her husband, but she was found out, and nobody got hurt, but uh, ricin's really nasty stuff. It's actually a protein. Uh, it gets into your, uh, once you ingest it, uh, gets into your uh, blood supply, and then it will uh, cause uh, liver failure. Usually takes about 36 to 48 hours, uh, for the effects to start really happening and bad things to go on. Uh, you're going to notice that your heart's going to start beating really fast and you're going to start sweating and you're going to have all kinds of little pains and just not feel really good uh, before you go into uh, complete liver failure. The good news is um, if you know that you've ingested this or the doctors suspect that, they can get the ricin protein out of your system. Uh, it's a long process, uh, but you can be saved. The problem is most people eat it and don't know that they've eaten it. Uh, so very nasty plant. Okay. This is deadly nightshade. Uh, it's, um, in the same family as it's solarium, I believe is the Latin name. Uh, it's in the same family as potatoes, tomatoes, and eggplant, even though this one's quite deadly. Uh, there's even a and it, nightshade grows all around the world. There's even a variety of uh, nightshade that grows here in Texas. I have it on my property. Uh, fortunately for us Texans, the nightshade that grows here isn't quite as deadly as the stuff that grows in southern Europe, which is where the deadly nightshade is. Um, the, you'll notice the leaves are kind of a sickly green, and then the fruit is a dark black. Uh, dark, shiny black means don't eat. Uh, just like dark, shiny black spiders. Don't pick them up. <laughs> it's kind of nature's way of saying, hey, you know, beware. Um, the fruit on the ones here in Texas tends to be more of a yellow green color. Um, and it's not going to stuff here that we grow locally uh, probably won't kill you unless you're really allergic to it. Uh, but it's uh, would make you quite ill. There's two compounds uh, in the uh, nightshade that um, kind of do you in. And one of them is called atropine sulfate, uh, hence the atropa in the Latin name of the atropa belladonna. Atropine sulfate actually has a lot of uses. And one of them is to dilate your eyes. And that's actually, even though eye doctors, they make it synthetically now. Uh, this is what eye doctors use to, when you go to the, get an eye exam and they dilate your eyes big time. Uh, it's atropine sulfate. The other one is called scopolamine, uh, which uh, is sometimes used for people that have uh, mental disorders and other kind of uh, psychiatric type things. Um, the other interesting thing about atropine sulfate is it is the anti or the antidote, if you will, uh, for organic phosphate nerve agents uh, like uh, sarin gas and some of these other things. So uh, when our troops go into where they think there's WMDs and one of them might be a, a nerve gas agent, they carry around EpiPens with atropine sulfate, uh, which is, I always find kind of interesting that one, one poison is the antidote for another. So that's kind of interesting. An interesting fact about the plant itself is back in the Renaissance time, in, especially in Italy, women would take the... Uh, little berries and grind them up and then dilute them down in water and put the eye drops and use eye drops to make their eyes dilated because apparently men in the middle ages thought women with big dark eyes uh, were quite sexy. So uh, kind of interesting fact about the plant, uh, but generally it, it uh, grows about two to three feet tall. Uh, it's a uh, perennial in most places where it is. I know like uh, down in where we have our ranch, uh, the, people who raise cattle down there, they will walk through their pastures looking for this and pull it out so the cattle don't eat it because it can make them really sick as well. Okay, this is death camma. It's actually a pretty little flower. Uh, it's actually native to the United States. Uh, it grows in uh, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, uh, Colorado, uh, and the eastern parts of uh, Washington and Oregon. 
Uh, it likes mountainous areas. It usually grows in the high meadow region where the tree line has just stopped and then you've got a bunch of grass until you get high enough to where nothing else is growing. Um, every part of this plant is dangerous. Uh, it grows three to four feet tall. It blooms in the spring, uh, like late March, early April. And it actually has a bulb, uh, like an onion. And uh, uh, ranchers will go through every spring uh, when they put cattle into a, or livestock into a new uh, pasture and will look for this and dig it out before they let the animals in because it will kill them. It's uh, every mammal that I've read about it, it, uh, can be killed by this plant. Uh, one of the interesting things about the plant is back during the Lewis and Clark expedition, I think that was like in what, 1803 through 1806, something like that. Um, they were looking for the Northwest Passage, which really didn't exist. Uh, but anyway, they were on their way, uh, making it towards the Pacific Ocean, and they got stuck in a huge snowstorm and were hunkered down. And they were with a bunch of uh, Native Americans, and they were just literally starving to death. And they went out foraging for food and some of the guys thought they were digging up wild onions and actually dug up some some onions onions. and uh, died and therefore uh after that they quit foraging for food and then just uh, started slaughtering their horses to have something to eat so it's kind of interesting little fact about that plant okay this is the suicide tree uh fortunately for us it doesn't grow here uh, it is native to uh, like Bangladesh. Uh, uh, it's called Miramar now. It used to be called Burma, Thailand, uh, that part of the world. It likes swampy, marshy areas where the salt water and the fresh water kind of mix, uh, kind of like a mangrove tree, if you will. And if you look at it, you might think, wow, that looks an awful lot like an oleander bush. Well, they're in the same family. And if you didn't know it, oleanders are pretty poisonous, but this one's really poisonous. Uh, all parts of the plant are poisonous. Um, it is the number one cause of suicide in India and Bangladesh, where people will grind this up and uh, put it into a strong curry. Uh, apparently, the taste of the plant itself is really, really bitter. Uh, and a lot of these plants that are poisonous uh, do have a bitter taste if you were to eat them. Um, something about alkaloids and, you know, have a bitter flavors. And uh, so they use curry to cover up the bitter flavor. Oh, I forgot to mention at the beginning of my thing, uh, kind of hold all your questions till the end. We got quite a few people on the line and then we'll give plenty of time to uh, answer questions then. Um, but anyway, back to this plant, uh, it grows about 30 to 40 feet tall. And the toxin that's in this plant <coughs> causes kidney and liver failure. And basically, uh, you would ingest the plant and then you're going to get really nauseous and have a lot of, you know, heart palpitations, uh, sweating, convulsions. And then as soon as your liver fails, then of course, you, you know, you're going to go into a coma and then you're going to die. Uh, there is no antidote for it. And one of the interesting side uh, tidbits about the plant is the actual toxin is called cerberellium. And it does not appear on normal routine, uh, 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 like toxicology reports that the police would do like for murders or suicides or whatever. They actually have to specifically go in and look for this one. So um, not a fun plant to have. Okay, let's talk about some dangerous plants now. Uh, probably the most dangerous plant on the planet is tobacco. The World Health Organization uh, estimates that from 1900 to the year 2000, so it's like 100 years, um, over 100 million people worldwide actually died as a result of tobacco use. Um, that's, that's a lot. Um, uh, tobacco, as you can see in the pictures, is a big leafy uh, plant. It's actually native to uh, this hemisphere. Uh, the Native Americans use a lot of tobacco. <clears throat> Europeans didn't have tobacco until Columbus and those folks came and then uh, took it all back with them. Uh, and you can actually buy an ornamental uh, nicotine, nicotine tobacco plant. Uh, I've put it in my yard before. It's really great. Uh, it looks very similar. Now, the pictures I have are the tobacco that's grown to be smoked or chewed or whatever. Um, the, 
the trumpet shaped flower on the ornamental variety is actually a very long trumpet and it's all white, but it grows in just like this, except, and the leaves are a little bit more narrower. Uh, the tobacco that's grown for smoking purposes, obviously they want big wide leaves because that's the part you smoke uh, versus the small narrower leaves with a more pronounced flower for the ornamental variety. Um, but if you notice on the picture on the right here, or excuse me, the left, <coughs> excuse me, have these little flowers and then you get these pods down here after the flowers have died. And inside those are, are uh, the, the seed pod. And there could be a thousand seeds in this little pod here. They're really tiny little black seeds, almost like mustard seeds, really tiny. Well, the two major problems with tobacco <coughs> are um, the nicotine and the tars. Uh, the nicotine is responsible for uh, basic, your basic heart disease. Uh, nicotine causes your uh, blood pressure to elevate by constricting your blood vessels. Uh, and then it also gives you a mild uh, high, if you will. Uh, if you've never smoked a tobacco at all and you go out and puff one, I promise you, you will get a buzz. Uh, and it probably won't be all that pleasant. Uh, I remember back when I was a teenager and experimented with cigarettes, you know, uh, it, it really did give you a buzz when you first start smoking. And if you, you know, smoke it really hard and fast, it'll get you really buzzed. Uh, but it, nicotine's one of the most addictive uh, things on the planet. It's actually more addicting than cocaine, believe it or not. Uh, the way it fits into the receptors uh, in, your, in your brain, uh, the chemical receptors. Anyway, back to this. Uh, so as bad as nicotine is for you, it is the tar that is really the bad stuff. Um, tobacco is basically responsible, obviously lung cancer, brain cancer, and pancreatic cancer, the three big ones. Um, all three types of cancer that are associated with tobacco also metastasize. So if you have it in one area and you're not diagnosed young uh, or early stages, if you get beyond stage three, it's already metastasized. It's in your body someplace and you're going to have a really long, hard struggle. Uh, my best friend was a heavy smoker. He was a two pack a day guy until he got diagnosed with lung cancer. And uh, they gave him uh, 18 months. Uh, he did chemo and radiation and his, sur his uh, <coughs> tumor was inoperable. So uh, he couldn't do surgery, but it, he ended up making it 30 months. So he went, you know, almost a, another year and a half past what they gave him when he first got diagnosed. And he was totally asymptomatic until one day he got a little bit of a cough. It didn't go away after about six months, he went to the doctor and he was already stage three and a half by the time uh, he got it. And his tumor was in one his left lung and it had wrapped around his heart. So, which is what made it inoperable, but the tar in the nick, the tar and tobacco actually um, changes your DNA. And that's, it, it, it causes DNA mistakes when your cells replicate. And uh, it's, it's very documented on, uh, on the, there's multiple types of, of lung cancers and small cell carcinoma. Only people who smoke or live with smokers get that. Nobody else gets that, uh, or I won't say never, but very rarely. So anyway, enough about tobacco. It always makes me sad kind of talking about my friend, Tim. Uh, this is Jimson weed. It is considered a dangerous plant. Uh, again, it is um, known by a lot of names, uh, Datura, Moonflower, Devil's Trumpet, uh, Loco Weed. These are all uh, names for the same plant. Uh, Native Americans used to use it occasionally if they wanted to uh, torture uh, one of their captives or um, uh, the medicine men might do it. Uh, the plant's hallucinogenic. Uh, all parts of the plant are hallucinogenic. Um, the interesting thing about the plant is not only does it have these nice big wide leaves, which also kind of give you that uh, dinosaur kind of feel in your garden, but the flowers open up at night and smell like gardenias. Uh, so it blooms at night, smells like gardenias, you know, what's not to like other than the fact that it, you know, can make you really sick. Um, you'll notice on the uh, plant itself, there's these uh, pods here. And just like on the, um, oh, what do you, I hate it when I have Rick Perry moments, um, the castor bean plant, this one also has a lot of spikes on it. Every time the plant flowers, if it gets uh, pollinated by uh, a either a moth or a uh, bee or whatever, or hummingbird, um, 
every flower will produce a seed pod. I'm going to go back for a second here so you can see it. So you can see all those little spiky things there. Then that's what one looks like in um, uh, when it's not, uh, when it's up with a lot of flowers on it. And then there's a close up of the flower. And these things get big. Um, I've actually got one growing down at my place in the hill country right now that's about 20 feet wide. It's in a really happy, happy spot. Uh, it's a, it's actually an annual, but it acts like a perennial here in Texas. And it, you can find it grown on the sides of the roads or whatever. Um, it's also the host plant for, uh, I forget which moth it is. Uh, it's a huge, I want to say it's a gypsy moth, but I could be wrong on that. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but if you, uh, have one of these around and it's blooming and right about dusk, you'll see something that looks like a big hummingbird zipping around. It's actually this moth, uh, because it's the host plant for this. Um, the, uh, inside those, uh, seed pods, instead of being three or four, like on the castor bean plant, there are literally thousands of seeds. So this is the gift that keeps on giving. Um, I actually have a landscaping business and I actually put these plants in quite a, when I have a big space, it's got a lot of sun and, uh, want something to fill in. That's going to take over. Uh, this is a good flower for that. And again, you get a lot of benefits. You just don't want to be uh, excuse me, uh, eating it or ingesting it in any way. Uh, if you ingest it, basically, um, you're going to feel nauseous for a little while, and then you're going to start having hallucinations. And basically you're going to go on a trip very similar to LSD, except it's not supposed to be pleasant. It's supposed to be a lot of dark thoughts and, you know, I, <coughs> kind of a nasty experience. Um, the, uh, uh Oh, I know what I was going to say. Uh, back during the Bacon Rebellion, this is right before the American Revolution, <coughs> in uh, Virginia, uh, some of the um, British people had uh, quartered their troops in some of the settlers' homes and farms and stuff, and they weren't really happy about it. Uh, so they made a stew out of Jimson weed and served it to the British soldiers, and they all took a trip for about a week. And uh, needless to say, weren't able to fight or engage in any of the uh, activities during the rebellion. So just something to think about if we're ever invaded uh, and, you know, we're occupied, feed them some of this stuff. That'll, that'll do them in. Patriotic duty. Okay, let's see here. Why is that not? Oh, that's why. Ah, that's not supposed to happen. Oh, well, we'll just do it this way. Okay, moving on. Oh. That went too far. This is the Mackinac tree. Um, it is native to the uh, Caribbean. Uh, if you go down to St. Lucia or Aruba or you know any of those islands, Jamaica down there, you may see these trees growing. Um, like the one in the photograph, they grow right along the, the coastal water. They like it swampy, marshy. Uh, it's not a very uh, good looking tree at all. It does have fruit that looks like apples and, and actually tastes like apples. Uh, but you do not want to be eating these guys. Um, usually, if you go down there, you'll find the sign that says uh, anything that with this on it, do not eat um, with the sign. Uh, basically, the all parts of the tree are dangerous. Uh, if you eat the apples, they contain an acid that will actually dissolve and burn your throat. Uh, so you eat it. It tastes like an apple. Tastes good. You munch it on it. Uh, a few minutes later, you start getting this little peppery kind of aftertaste, kind of almost like eating a jalapeno, and then it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, and then it just starts burning the heck out of you, and it will actually uh, blister the inside of your mouth, your esophagus, and even inside your stomach, <clears throat> and can kill you. Uh, you do not want to park your car under this tree when it's raining because the, it will burn and dissolve the paint on your car. It will also burn you and cause your skin to blister if you stand under this tree. Uh, it's almost like something out of a you know sci-fi movie, but it's real. The, these things really happen here in the United or in the, in the world. Uh, there's what the fruit looks like, uh, just like a small little green apple. Okay, so. You might say, what does corn, potatoes, and beans all have in common? At some point in their uh, growing, they can actually not be very healthy for you. So let's talk about corn. And you might say, oh, I eat corn all the time. It's great stuff. Yes, it is, believe it or not. Uh, corn was native to the United States, or not to the United States, but to this hemisphere. Uh, the 
the Spanish invaders actually took it back to Europe with them and thought, oh, this is great. Because back in the 14, 1500s, you were either royalty or you were basically a peasant serf. And the royalty was always looking for ways to keep the peasants fed because a well-fed peasant doesn't revolt. And they thought corn was the answer. It's easy to grow. It tastes good. You can do a lot of stuff with it. Uh, and it's you know fairly healthy or so they thought. Well, what they didn't know is that corn has an enzyme in it that prevents your body from absorbing vitamin B6. And if you eat and have a subsistence living on corn alone, which a lot of people did, uh, you get this disease called pellagra. And pellagra is Spanish for sour skin. And if you look at this guy's hands and arms and stuff, you'll see what I mean. They just, eventually you'll die from this. Um, and believe it or not, it was 1937 when uh, a guy at Walter Reed Hospital actually figured this out. And there were, at one time, there were uh, 3 million people with pellagra in the United States. And most of them lived up in Appalachia and then in the deep South where they were dirt poor subsistence farmers who basically didn't eat a lot of meat. Uh, meat's where you get most of your vitamin B6 from. And so if you're not eating a lot of meat and you're eating a lot of corn and you know trying to live, uh, this is what's gonna happen to you. Now, you, this disease is pretty much vanished nowadays because we have a really good standard of living and people uh, in the United, fortunately in the United States do eat a lot of meat and that keeps us healthy. But uh, one of the interesting things I found out when I was doing the research about this <clears throat> is that even though uh, especially like in the Aztecs and the Incas and those people in the Mayans, they ate an, a lot of corn. And, but what they did was they treated the corn with lye and turned it into hominy. Just like uh, you, if you uh, make tortillas, the, the, what do you call it? The, the masa has been actually, the corn's been cured in, in lye and that deactivates the enzyme, which I just find that fascinating. These this culture did not even have the wheel, had, could not invent the wheel, but they figured out a way to get the, the enzyme out of the, the corn so they could eat corn. I just find that fascinating. But anyway, uh, so this is not really something we have to worry about today. Uh, kidney beans. Believe it or not, red kidney beans, you know, you, we've all heard the little story about, you know, beans, the magical fruit. Well, kidney beans ha actually have a lot of that particular uh, chemical in them. Uh, and I'm not going to even try to pronounce it. Oh, I thought I had a slide of that, but uh, I used to have a slide that said what the chemical was. It's about 27 letters long, and it starts with phyto. Uh, I can't remember how it's pronounced, but anyway, um, this chemical can give you a lot. It's not going to kill you, but it's going to give you a lot of gastric distress, uh, a lot of flatulence, a lot of uh, diarrhea, that sort of thing, and, and can it make you pretty uh, unwell. So when you're de dealing with beans, especially kidney beans, uh, you want to, uh, if they're dried beans, you want to soak them. And then you never want to use the soaking water. You want to chuck that out and then rinse them really good. And that will get rid of a lot of the chemical. The other thing is the chemical is deactivated at 165 degrees. So if you're using canned beans, you don't have to worry about it because during the canning process, uh, they, 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 heat all the vegetables and stuff in the cans. So that's going to deactivate this. But uh, if you're using dried kidney beans, definitely want to uh, 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 soak them well, rinse them well, and rinse them several times. And uh, you shouldn't have any problems then. Let's talk about some illegal plants now. <clears throat> We're just going to talk about two of them because there's actually a ton of them. Um, we'll talk about marijuana the first because that's what most people know about. Um, Marijuana is in the hemp family. Uh, it grows all over the world. Uh, people have been using marijuana for different things throughout history. Uh, there's some caves down on the Rio Grande that, where they found some baskets and stuff that date to 3500 BC. They've actually found not only was the baskets made out of hemp, but they actually found marijuana dried in the baskets themselves. So uh, native cultures or uh, what uh, original cultures, whatever you want to call them, have been using uh, marijuana for, for some time. Um, 
Marijuana is a hermaphroditic plant. It can be either male or female. Uh, if you're growing marijuana for, shall we, shall we say, illegal purposes, you want the female plants because they have more of the active psychotropic ingredient, which is called Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. Uh, that's basically what gets you high. And you can have different, you know, different plants. There's different hybrids now. There's all kinds of stuff. Um, and uh, marijuana is extremely easy to grow. Uh, basically, it need, just needs sunlight and water. It will grow in really horrible, crappy soil. Um, doesn't need a whole lot of extra nutrients or anything. Um, the plants can get up to 20, 30 feet tall if they're cultivated that long enough. Usually they're harvested before then. Um, and a lot of people actually grow them indoors uh, <clears throat> because they're uh, marijuana actually has a really peculiar smell. It's almost like a skunk, if you will, um, especially if it has a lot of the uh, tetrahydrocannabinol oil in it. Um, the more oil it has, the more it smells. The more it smells, the more people know that that's what you're growing. In fact, uh, in the city of Allen, which is a suburb, just a couple of burbs north of us here in Dallas, uh, there, a couple of years, a friend of mine's a cop there, and he was telling me about it. Uh, this guy had a rent house and he didn't really live there. And the neighbors didn't think much about it. And he kept his yard mowed, everything just like a nice, you know, North Dallas suburb would. Uh, and then they started noticing this funky smell and they thought the guy traveled a lot cause he wasn't there. Um, they called animal control. They came out and you no, know, no skunks. So uh, they called the police cause they knew exactly what it was. So they kept an eye on the house and, um, the next thing you know, when he showed up, they arrested him and he had lots and lots and lots of marijuana. Basically, every room was turned into a grow room growing marijuana. And he had uh, several hundred thousand dollars worth of plants in there growing. Um, so it's that's one of the ways that you can get caught growing marijuana is by the smell. The other way is uh, if they suspect you, uh, they will start looking at you. The police will start looking at your utility bills because you've got these grow lights going 24 seven. You're using a lot more electricity than any of your neighbors. So that's another way that the police have to uh, determine this. As far as the actual effects of marijuana, um, there's a general feeling of elation, uh, the high, if you will. Um, it, you know, of course, if you've seen a Cheech and Chong movie, you know about the munchies and, you know, getting stupid, that sort of thing is, you know, kind of giggly. Um, it also can cause uh, other problems. Uh, marijuana also has a lot of tar in it. So uh, people who think, oh, it's marijuana. It's OK. I can smoke this. Well, guess what, folks? You're getting about you're getting way more tar, actually, than the cigarettes. Now, it's a different tar, but your lungs were not made for tar. Uh, lungs are made for oxygen. And so uh, if you've ever smoked a water pipe or even a joint or whatever, and you've looked at that, you know, it gets really tarry at the ends. Well, what's not getting tarry there is getting tarry inside your lungs. So not a good thing. Um, it is not physically addicting like a lot of drugs, say like heroin or something is where your body, your body physically craves marijuana. That's not going to happen. But it can be mentally addicting to people who have addictive type tendencies. Um, of course, back in the 1930s, marijuana was Ill, was legal until I think 36 or 37. And then the government put in a big campaign about, you know, getting rid of it and, you know, how horrible it was and all this. Well, like most things the government does, all propaganda. Um, so not really true. The World Health Organization estimates that there are about 200 million people worldwide that use marijuana on a daily basis and about 25 million inside the United States. And that number's probably actually gone up a little bit since that study was done since several states have uh, legalized the use of marijuana now. Um, oh, that's enough about that. Okay, this is the peyote cactus. Uh, it is one of several cactuses that do not have thorns on them. Um, it is native to the Sonoran Desert, which uh, is South Texas and Northern Mexico. Um, the peyote cactus likes to grow in uh, caliche, really, you know, rocky uh, desert, uh, stuff where most other things aren't going to grow. Um, Star County, which is along the Rio Grande, has probably the most peyote 
uh, in of any county here in Texas. Um, it's uh, actually get, becoming quite scarce because so many people are trying to harvest it now. Uh, it's also a class one controlled substance. So if you get caught with peyote, you are going to jail. Uh, no questions asked, uh, unless you're a Native American and you're participating in a religious ceremony. Um, basically, the peyote, uh, it's a small cactus. These things are only three or four inches in diameter. And then it blooms in the spring with these little pink flowers. And you can see the remnants of the little flowers on the picture here. The um, Typically, if you're going to harvest this, uh, you're going to cut the cactus from the main. It has little, like a lot of cacti and agave type, succulent type plants. They have pups that come up everywhere. So if you cut one, you're probably, and long as you dig the root up, you're still going to have the plant come back, hopefully. Um, but anyway, uh, they cut these things into little diamond or uh, buttons, which you can kind of see the ridges there. They were like wedges, like on an orange almost. They, they cut them up. They'd let them dry. And then typically, uh, if you're going to ingest this for the purposes of getting high, uh, you would want to eat it with food because uh, like some of these other poisonous plants, uh, the uh, psychotropic substances are also really bitter tasting. So basically, you'd mix this with some, I don't know, scrambled eggs or whatever, uh, eat it. About 30 minutes later, you're going to barf it all back up, uh, which doesn't sound like too much fun. And then, then it's time for your trip to begin. Uh, shortly after barfing, um, you will notice that you will be able to um, smell colors, uh, uh, you know, hear colors. Uh, visions, uh, everything will be totally distorted. Um, uh, it's supposed to be fun. Don't know, never done it. Um, this is uh, one of those things that, you know, it's for some people, but not others, I guess. Um, the trips last anywhere from eight to 12 hours, depending on how much you've ingested and your uh, body's resistance to the toxins and that sort of thing. Um, but it's supposed to be fun. Uh, there's back in the 1950s, there was a whole thing called the beat generation. Uh, Ken Kesey, who wrote the book, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. You've probably seen the movie. Um, supposedly got the idea for his book while taking peyote. Uh, he was actually working as a security guard at a mental institution. And supposedly he did some peyote and got the idea about this for this book. So, uh, it was a very interesting story. It won an Academy Award, I think, that year. Um, it was also really big with uh, a guy named Allen Ginsberg, who was one of the beat poets at the time. Um, his most famous poem is called The Howl. Uh, hopefully, you've never had to read it. Uh, I took an English lit class in college, and we had to read it. It's 680 pages of gibberish. Um, I don't recommend it uh, unless you just are glutton for poetic punishment. Um, but anyway, it was really big. Uh, there's also a book out by Tom Wolf called The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test, which was about the Merry Pranksters, which is all these Ken Kesey, Allen Ginsberg, and all those guys. They basically drove up and down California in this old psychedelic bus, <coughs> excuse me, doing drugs and uh, having a little merry way of life. So if you want to learn about that, that's a great book to read. Um, what else can I tell you about this? Oh, uh, and then in this, it kind of went out of favor uh, when other drugs became more popular in the 70s, like LSD and that sort of thing. <laughs> Excuse me. My Zyrtec D just kicked in. I all of a sudden got really dry. Um, in the 1970s, there was like a reemergence of the popularity of peyote. And it was brought on by a guy named Carlos Castaneda, who was a um, anthropologist at the University of Southern California. And he's written, well, he's dead now, but he wrote, I don't know, probably a dozen or so books about uh, his, he went down into uh, Northern Mexico and met this guy named Don Juan uh, Mateos, who's a, uh, for lack of a better word, an Indian sorcerer. And they did a lot of peyote and mescaline together which is a powderized version of peyote. And uh, then he wrote about these, he wrote all these books about his experiences. And there's a, if you uh, Google Carlos Castaneda, there's a whole cult following because he developed almost like a whole religion behind this of, of his own that you can uh, get into if you're into that sort of thing. 
Okay, let's talk about some intoxicating plants now. Uh, this first one's called henbane. Uh, <clears throat> it's also in the same family as the nightshade and all that other stuff. So a very big family with lots of weird plants. Uh, as you can see in the photo, this one's kind of hairy. And it's actually a very ugly plant, I think. And the flower is ugly. The colors are ugly. It's, there's nothing uh, very pretty about this plant. But this plant was the uh, one of the main plants they used in the fermentation process when making beer in the days before they decided to start using hops to flavor the beer. Uh, beer was flavored with henbane. And henbane has been known since, since Greek and Roman times for producing uh, visions. And uh, in fact, uh, in Greece, the uh, people who worshiped the goddess Apollo, uh, the priests the priest and the priestesses would make a, a concoction out of henbane and they'd drink it down. And then in the, about halfway through the ceremony, they'd have, start having all these pronouncements and having visions and, you know, all this stuff. So not a very pretty plant. And, uh, but a very interesting plant. Uh, it's actually native to uh, Eastern Europe and uh, Western Asia. So, you know, Poland, uh, Romania, Bulgaria, Russia, that sort of Ukraine, that sort of world is where this plant grows. And uh, it's, I don't think it's used for much of anything today. In fact, I would imagine if you were a farmer or a rancher and you found this growing in your property, you'd probably want to dig it out and get, just get rid of it. Then the next plant is the wormwood plant. It's in the Artemisia family. Uh, many, and there's varieties of Artemisia that's native to Texas. Uh, this particular one is the Artemisia absthenium. Um, it is native to uh, Northern and Central Europe. Uh, and as you can see from the photo, it looks just like the Artemisia that we grow here. Uh, it gets these little yellow flowers and it was used for a couple of different things. Uh, people would put it into their cabinets and wardrobes and stuff and under their mattresses to prevent bed bugs and lice and mice and not mice, uh, mites and all that sort of uh, little buggy vermin from getting into their wardrobes and clothing and beds. Uh, and they also made a drink out of it called absinthe. Uh, it was really popular until the early 1900s, um, and there's a whole little culture around how you drink absinthe. They actually have these special cups and these special little slotted spoons, and you put the absinthe in the cup, and then you put the spoon over the top, and then you put a sugar cube in, and then you slowly pour water over your sugar cube until it dissolves, and then you use the spoon to stir it up, and then you sip your absinthe. And uh, it was really big in the Parisian scene. And then uh, it was around 1905, 1907, somewhere in there. Uh, some guy in Switzerland murdered his entire family. And they blamed it on the beverage absinthe. And they decided that absinthe caused uh, psychedelic, you know, experiences and caused you to have psychic breaks in reality and become a murderer and all this. So it was outlawed for quite a few years. And then in the 1970s, some research was done on it and it found out that it really wasn't the bad stuff they thought it was. And so you can now buy it again. It has sort of a licorice taste. If you're familiar with Pernod or Ouzo or Ricard, it's kind of like that. Um, when you pour the water in, it gets all cloudy and kind of milky colored. Um, I bought a bottle just so I could see what it was like because I've heard all about it. And um, it tastes like kind of a licorice flavored drink. I didn't see what was so special about it. But anyway, um, it's out there if you want it. Um, I actually think Uzo and Ricard and Pernod actually taste better than the actual absinthe. But, I, you know, but that's just everybody's personal taste. Um, another interesting thing about this uh, is there's actually a bar in New Orleans called the Absinthe Bar. It's right off Bourbon Street, and it's the oldest continuous bar in the United States. And if you go down there and you uh, go in, you can actually sit at the same bar that Mark Twain and Frank Sinatra and uh, Andrew Jackson and uh, the uh, Roosevelt and some other famous people have sat at because it's a really popular place. I, I think even the pirate Jean Lafitte uh, had a few drinks there on occasion. So um, interesting stuff. Okay, now let's move to some destructive plants because I'm getting out of, about out of time here. Um, one of the most destructive plants on the planet, at least in the United States, is kudzu. 
Uh, it was actually native to Japan. Uh, it was brought over to the United States in the mid 1800s, right before the Civil War, to use as fodder for cattle. Uh, somebody got the brainy idea that, hey, you know, this stuff grows like crazy. Let's get it and uh, feed it to cattle, and it's good for them. And sure enough, it was. Uh, cattle love this stuff. What they didn't take into consideration is that in Japan has a very cool climate. But in the middle of Georgia, where they first introduced this stuff, it's hot and humid. And this stuff said, hmm, this is much better than our homeland. This stuff is awesome. And it grows like crazy. Well, what they didn't realize is that in a hot, humid climate, kudzu will grow a foot a day. And it spreads through seeds, rhizomes, and runners. So you get the triple trifecta of how plants propagate and this one actually has gone crazy so in the last 150 years it's actually made it to the uh, eastern part of texas now <clears throat> if you fly into uh, hartfield at airport in atlanta and you you're getting ready to land you're coming through the clouds and you see all this beautiful green well not all of it's pine trees a bunch of it is this stuff i used to have to go to atlanta on business quite often and um, one of my clients was in a, a warehouse district on the southeast part of town. And next door, they had a nice new modern building and all that. But next door to them was in a building that had been abandoned. And it was just laying there vacant. And kudzu had taken over the entire thing. It looked like something out of a Tim Burton movie. Uh, really, truly uh, bizarre looking. I mean, it covered everything. The telephone poles, the building, the machinery, everything just covered and uh, about the only way you can actually keep up with this is uh, bring in, a, you know, several hundred goats and put them to town eating because they will eat it. But it won't kill it. It'll just eat it down to the roots, uh, but it will not kill it. Uh, even like uh, herbicides like Roundup really don't work on it. It'll, it'll slow it down, but it really doesn't kill it. Uh, 2,4-D will slow it down, but it doesn't kill it. So it's a very, very hardy plant. Uh, one of the interesting things, though, is there's actually some research going on at Harvard right now where they found a chemical compound in kudzu that actually shows some potential for helping people who have addiction issues. So hopefully, uh, you know, something good will come out of the kudzu. And this is the water hyacinth. Um, water hyacinth is native to Southeast Asia. Uh, and it was brought over here also in the 1800s thinking, oh, this would be a pretty thing for our ponds and, uh, you know, and lakes and stuff because it has a beautiful flower. Well, what they didn't realize is, yes, it's a beautiful flower. And the uh, plant shoots up a flower every couple of days that, shoots, that stands about two feet or so above the water. And it is actually a very pretty plant. But the problem is down here in the south, uh, this plant can grow three feet a day. And what it ends up happening is it will cover an entire water surface. Um, if you get this stuff in your lake, it will cover the entire lake. It will uh, cause all the oxygen to deplete out of the lake so all your fish die. And then so you've got a giant, uh, basically, cesspool that's filling full of mosquitoes because the mosquitoes love murky growth conditions like that. So it's extremely hard to get rid of. Uh, once it's in a lake or a pond, uh, you basically have to drain the water out and then dredge it to get all the little bits off the bottom because even the little root things will get into the mud at the bottom and then uh, repropagate later. Uh, one of the, I've, when I first did my uh, research on this, one of the uh, garden clubs I was doing a presentation to, a lady in the audience said, and she was from East Texas, and said that they had a house out in East Texas on a lake and the homeowners, they had to get this stuff out of the lake because it was destroying their lake. So they, they drained the lake and it cost each homeowner 10,000 bucks. Everybody basically that lived on the lake had to chip in to get this stuff out. And it, it, the lake actually sat empty for two years to make sure that the roots dried out enough to where this plant was totally dead. And then they had to refill their lake. So it's a big mess. Uh, in Florida, the state spends about $10 billion so far uh, keeping the Florida waterways clear of this stuff because uh, it's just it just propagates and propagates and propagates. Now, it's illegal to import the water hyacinth into the United States now, but it, it's you can still buy it. Uh, I mean, I, I went to a 
a uh, home pond show and there were people selling them now you know in your home pond it's not really a big deal because you know you're talking about a couple of square feet but you know if you get out you know can you imagine what would happen if lake levon got covered with the stuff or lake uh, texoma or lake ray hubbard oh it'd be it would be just horrible it'd be almost you know probably just as bad as those zebra snails and stuff just in a different way anyway enough of that so that's the end of my presentation. Then we're going to open it up for some questions real quick. Um, Dallas Master Gardeners, we're here to help you. <coughs> we don't man the help desk anymore. I need to update my slide. Uh, we do everything through email now, at least until this COVID thing's over with. So if you have any kind of questions or anything, now I'm going to open it up to uh, stop this and see if anybody has questions or anything. Um, can whoever is moderating open up the microphones for people so they can ask questions or do i do that uh um well we have some um kevin th that was fascinating I, i've learned a lot about <laughs> uh, i have a detour in my backyard so i didn't i really i knew it was poisonous but i didn't know exactly what it did so now i know yeah, just don't eat it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um so we had a few questions um this may not be something you know the answer to but um do you know if there's a less tar if you vape marijuana versus <laughs> smoking it? I'm sorry, you, I kind of cut out just a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so the question um, was, um, is there a lot of tar if you vape marijuana? And like I said, this may not be something that you know the answer oh. to. Oh, if you vape it? You mean like those? Yeah. Um, probably not. Uh, although... I don't think vaping is good for you either. I mean, I wouldn't vape tobacco or, you know, nicotine either. Um, well, and, and, and in Texas, uh, it would be, you know, extremely illegal to vape. Uh, Texas will be the, if marijuana gets legalized, Texas will be the 50th state to do so. Uh, but uh, it, 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 it's, uh, I would not think vaping because the, the tar, when you vape, they basically have, have sucked the stuff out of the plant. Although there's, it, I don't really know that much about vaping. I know it's an oily stuff that you put in there and it just kind of heats it up. <clears throat> I would not think there would be as much tar. Hi, and um, Yvonne had put a question in the chat. Um, she's struggling with an invasive plant, which uh, is called false morning glory. I think she may be talking about bindweed is what I know it as with the purple flowers. And it's yes. three of her tomato plants and has runners and grows very fast. Um, do you have any any thoughts about bindweed or false morning glory? Yes, I have. It's once you get it, it is in, almost impossible to get rid of. Um, what I would do, well, it's what I do do to keep it under control, is once uh, don't let it flower. As soon as you see it, the vines, because every flower is producing lots and lots of seeds, and the bear the birds eat the seeds, and then they're they don't digest, so they're redepositing them uh, with a little gift of some bird fertilizer along with it. So it's going to just take off. Um, the best way to get rid of it is to dig it up. Uh, it actually has a pretty good root, and it has a taproot that will go down two or three feet. Um, so if you can't dig it up, uh, get some 2,4-D, uh, which is a herbicide. Um, it's actually a, a defoliant. And it, instead of spraying it because the bindweed is going to grow inside all your other plants that you don't want to die, use the concentrated 2,4-D and get one of those spongy paintbrushes and paintbrush it on the leaves as many as you can of the plant. And it will soak that up and then uh, it will tell the plant to drop all of its leaves. And then that will obviously if the plant doesn't have leaves, then there's no photosynthesis, no photosynthesis, the plant will die. That's going to be the easiest way to get rid of it. Uh, or you can just keep pulling it and pulling it and pulling it and, and call it daily exercise. Did that answer? Hello? Sorry, I am oh, muted some, myself. Sorry. <laughs> oh, somebody said, I just saw somebody post, uh, uh, where do you get 2,4-D? Uh, you can get it at any uh, uh, garden center, uh, Home Depot, Lowe's, uh, you know, Callaway's, North Haven, they, they all carry it. Uh, you may have to, re it may have a brand name and I can't think of any of the brand names at the moment off the top of my head, but if you read the ingredients, like as an example, Roundup is glyphosate or glyphosate, 
two, four D. Uh, if you read the ingredients, it'll say two comma four comma D, and then I'll have a huge long chemical name after it. Try something, something, something. And this is extremely nasty stuff. Uh, definitely wear gloves, rubber gloves when you're using this stuff. Uh, you've all heard of Agent Orange, that stuff they used in the Vietnam War. Agent Orange, 50% of Agent Orange is 2,4-D. The other stuff, the other 50% has been made illegal now, and you can't even, they don't even make it. Uh, but 2,4-D is some nasty stuff. Uh, it will, if you get it on a plant, it soaks enough of it, it will cause the plant to drop all of its leaves and die. Uh, that's kind of how it works. Versus Roundup is a, it's an herbicide, but it's actually a, a enzyme inhibitor. It inhibits when you put it on a plant, there's three enzymes that plants need to live, and it inhibits the plant from producing those enzymes. That's how Roundup works. Okay. Anything else? Uh, does anybody else have questions for um, Kevin? Uh, I put in the chat that I had good luck with um, the, it's the super concentrated vinegar, but it, that stuff can be, <laughs> be had. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit I mean, dangerous too. So wear gloves with that too. <laughs> yeah, uh, the horticultural vinegar. I mean, everybody you know likes to do organic, but horticultural vinegar is acetic acid. It's a yeah. chemical, uh, yeah. and it will kill everything. I mean, it's not discriminatory. It, if you get too, if you get horticultural vinegar on a good plant, it will kill the good plant as long as long with the bad one. So, it, yep. I, I'm a. I try to do everything organic as much as possible just because I don't like using chemicals, but if you have a big problem or a major infestation, that organic stuff is not going to work. I'm going to tell you right now. Uh, you, it, there is a reason God gave us brains to make these chemicals, and that's because they take care of big problems. Any other questions? Yeah, do we have, I haven't seen any other in the chat. Um, okay. Yeah, I think you were <laughs> very informative. I, I, I've learned a lot. Um, uh, Somebody oh, so just posted I, something. Yeah, so if so we use the vinegar or no, you don't plant it on the root. You would plant it. You would put it on the leaves. It, uh, you don't want to dig down and try to find the tap root. That just you're not going to be able to really do that effectively. Uh, so if you've got this big bindweed, just get that sponge brush and just start painting it on the leaves. And it'll take a you know 10 days or so before you start seeing anything. But it will. You, you'll see those leaves just start curling up and then they're going to drop off. And then even the one, the leaves that you didn't paint will, will be dropping off because the plant will absorb it and it'll get down to the roots and then it'll, it, the roots will send it back up with the food up to the leaves. Uh, if my dog eats the dead leaves, will it harm them? Um, that's a good question. I really don't know. Uh, probably. I mean, 2,4-Ds. I mean, it's pretty nasty stuff, um, but your dog's not going to eat dead leaves. Uh, th that dogs don't do that sort of thing. Uh, it's like all these poisonous plants. I've always get, well, what, what if my animal goes out and eats them? Well, they're not going to do that. They know better. Uh, the, as an example, the Datura plant, um, the flower smells like gardenias, but if you snap a branch off, that is like the nastiest smelling stuff, or the leaves. You tear a leaf and smell it. It is. It smells horrible. They're they're not going to eat it. Uh, and I've never seen a animal eat. It. Uh, I mean, even grasshoppers don't eat. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, oleander, that kind of plant. So like, and there's very few insects that even eat the datura. I mean, I've seen grasshoppers eat it, but other than that, I've never seen another insect eat it. Uh, nature knows. People are the only ones stupid enough to go out and eat poisonous plants. Any yeah, other? I, I, oh. oh, no, no. And I put a link to the, uh, with the manufacturer safety data sheet for 2,4-D. It, it usually has anything like. Oh, yeah. You know. Yeah. And yes. if, when you, when you buy it, uh, it'll have a, like a tear off thing off the, on the back of the bottle, uh, that'll have all kinds of stuff. Uh, uh, about more than you want to know about the plant or about, about the plant, about the, the chemical. All right. Well, don't see any other questions. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, Thank hopefully, you. <laughs> hopefully um, people will know what plants to avoid. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm glad. Every, and if you have want to have me back, I, I love chit chatting. So uh, anytime you need me, just give me a holler.
Will do. All right, Judy, do you want to wrap it up for us? Yes, thank you so much. Wow, that um, was so interesting. There's so many, and I'm sure you've got another hour's worth that you can share with us. So we will definitely talk to you and look forward to having you back. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, as always, we're so proud of our partnership with the Dallas Public Library to put on this program. And um, just uh, this will be um, airing again on the library's YouTube channel. So you, when it's up, you can see it. And just please let us know if you have any questions. You can always uh, contact us at greendallas at dallascityhall.com. And thank you for your time. Have a wonderful day and a wonderful week, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you, Kevin. Mm -hmm.